Imagine, if you would, the early 2010s. Humanity was still adapting to the new digital age, confused and befuddled from an onslaught of new technologies. But the future was bright, it was now, because we had virtual reality, again. But these, they were a far cry from those 90s headsets. No, these were cheaper, lighter, fit for home consumption. Oculus had launched its Kickstarter in 2012, and after that point, the news feeds and forums dripped with excitement for this tech. But for all the talk, for all the demonstrations, there was a slight hurdle we'd need to overcome before VR was proven as a viable market. See, almost nobody actually owned a headset. Getting in on day one wasn't for the faint of hearts. These were 300 bucks a pop, plus the necessity of a good PC rig. And they were, still, just dev kits. At best, it would be years, maybe even a decade, before the average Joe could just buy a VR unit on a whim. They needed to be cheaper, not require that expensive PC. But what if you could drop those barriers of entry, just let the non-tech enthusiast experience virtual reality right now without breaking the bank? And they could do it using the very device they held in their soft little pockets. This was the idea that led to the creation of Google Cardboard in 2014, made by a few Google employees as a side project, it would be introduced at I.O. as an inexpensive and easy way to just try out VR. If you don't know, Google Cardboard was a piece of cardboard. A piece of cardboard that you could assemble into a head-mounted display. You just slap your phone right into the thing and you're good to go. From here, the phone would do all the heavy lifting using gyroscopes, accelerometers, and other fancy sensors to track your head movement, projecting the vast VR vistas into your eyeballs. It seemed simple. Too simple. But keep in mind this wasn't entirely made of cardboard. You would need some glass lenses inside to focus the light. You would need some way to interact with what you see on screen, and this came in the form of a magnet placed on the side. The phone would use its compass to detect the magnet's position and function as a makeshift button. You'd also need an NFC chip to tell the phone when to display images in VR. This would split the screen into two and warp the images, making for a proper 3D display. Attendees at I.O. were left astonished by the novelty of it all. In a good way, mostly. This was VR, or at least an approximation of it. Right here, right now, on your phone. And it was open source, anybody could make applications, or even their own headset. Which would be important, because Google wasn't really selling it to the public. This was not supposed to be Google's next big thing, nor was it intended to compete with Oculus dev kits. It was just a fun experiment that would allow the average person to try out VR years before most would ever have a chance again. Normally, this would come and pass without much of a second glance. A fun new way to use your phone, but not something that would change the world. But in 2014, this seemed like a pretty big deal. VR was the hottest thing of the year, even if, again, not many people owned a headset. Sony had announced its Project Morpheus, a cheaper alternative to the Oculus kits that used a PS4. Even the illustrious Gabe Newell was getting in on the action. And of course, Facebook had just acquired Oculus for $2 billion. A lot of promise was here, a lot of high hopes for the glorious future of VR. But even these announcements were, well, just that. Announcements. PSVR wouldn't be out for a few years, and still it would cost several hundred dollars and require a PS4 to use. Oculus was nowhere close to releasing a consumer headset, and even when it would, it would still require that PC. For many people, if they wanted to try out VR, it was either this or nothing. Well, kind of. Cardboard wasn't actually the first phone VR product. A few headsets based on the same idea had already been around for a while. Even in 2011, before the Oculus was making headlines, Hasbro had released this, the My 3D Player. Even though it had many of the same features as seen on cardboard, using the gyroscopes and accelerometers of iPhones and iPods of the time, it was never marketed as VR, instead jumping on the 3D train as 360 degrees in 3D, but whereas these were were simply headsets with a few applications designed to work with them, cardboard was something more. 
It was a platform, the new de facto standard for phone VR. Google Cardboard, for as much press as it received, didn't really set the world on fire in 2014. Developers hadn't made any applications yet because, well, it was just created. Since Google wasn't offering any headsets for purchase, third parties offered various kits, but not many seemed to be buying. And if you wanted to make one yourself, well, you'd need to make one yourself. Google didn't seem too keen on putting big money behind this idea. It was fun. Okay, let's move on. But later in the year, Samsung would strike back, and this was no joke. They were all in on this phone VR, and it would manifest itself in this, the gear. Yes, the Gear VR was no cardboard. It couldn't get soggy in the rain. It was backed by Oculus, running proprietary software and services. The headset wasn't just a case for your phone. It had sensors and headphones and fancy touch things on the side. Whereas cardboard supported almost every modern Android phone, the Gear would be more selective. Only Samsung's flagship devices would be allowed to work with this. This meant developers could target higher specs, push more polygons, and the peasant phones were no longer a concern. You could download applications and launch them all without removing the phone from the headset. And it had a head strap, which is quite useful for these kinds of things. Samsung was quite proud of this new headset. They wanted to give it a certain mysterious allure. The launch version would be called the Gear VR Innovator Edition. It would release in late 2014 for $200. A limited launch for AT&T subscribers would be used to build up positive word of mouth. It would also only work with the Note 4, which cost $750 at the time. If the cardboard was the headset for the masses, this was for the chosen few. A few months later, they'd launch a revised version with support for more phones and better cooling systems. Reviews were optimistic. For those that had used it to see VR for the first time, it was a mind-blowing glimpse into the future. For experienced VR users, it was a cheaper and mobile alternative, but mostly acceptable. I mean, this was running off a phone without external sensors or wires. Considering the immediate success of this, it suddenly became a real possibility that the future of VR was this. Putting your phone in a weird little headset and hoping for the best. And there is nothing to disprove that. After all, these were the only mobile headsets at the time. In fact, they were the most popular headsets of the time. And Google got a bit more serious after this point. At I.O. 2015, Google had a new version of cardboard to show off. The filthy magnet was replaced with a trigger on top that used conductive foam. The lenses were ever slightly improved, and now it would fit larger devices. But the best part was you no longer needed to construct it. It came pre-built in a cool cardboard box, straight from Google. And now even the iPhones were supported. Whereas the 2014 version was a brief hit with existing enthusiasts, most people didn't run out and make their own units. But now, with the Gear VR remaining a hyped device, a lot more people were jumping on board to try out what was essentially a cheaper version of the Gear, which was already a cheaper version of PC-based VR. Cardboard's popularity hit new, undiscovered peaks. More manufacturers were producing higher quality kits, and the fact that iPhones could now use the device brought in even more people, more developers. Unity supported it. Unreal Engine supported it. This was around the time when I got my first set, a Viewmaster throwback looking thing. Being right out of high school with little money to my name and a PC that was burning up inside an accordion case, this was the only way I could try out the ever fabled VR. And I gotta say, I was actually quite impressed. It was 3D. When I moved my head around, the image moved as well. There was a sense of depth I wasn't expecting. Sure, it wasn't full immersion, but hey, it runs on my phone. Going back to the standard demo that comes with the cardboard app is somehow nostalgic to me seven years on. The birds, the flowers, the trees, the water, the dog thing. It's a vibe. Peak mid-2010s phone VR aesthetic. It wasn't perfect, though. As for the picture quality, it was bad. Just about as bad as you could imagine. Taking a phone from 2015, cutting the image in half, and placing it inches from your face doesn't result in a very clean image. It can actually be kind of hard to tell what's going on. This isn't just the screen door effect. No, if you really look, you can see the individual LED colors. Reading text was quite a challenge, but at the time, it was acceptable. You might notice a common theme in these Google VR demos. It's all very low polygonal, and that's not just because of 
hipster art design. Rendering two images at once, calculating motion at a high frame rate, and able to run on almost every smartphone isn't going to be possible unless the assets in the world are fairly simplistic. This is one of the many trade-offs of having a platform that runs on everything. But in other ways, it's aged actually quite well. At least compared to most of the other things put out for cardboard. I have a video on my other channel going through a lot of these apps, and you can check that out later if you want. And while a lot of the things other developers were making were not good, this was a fun novelty. Certainly not something you'd want to use for more than a few minutes, but it really did feel like a look into the future. At least to me. Many did not feel this way. Keep in mind by this point, Google Cardboard was the most popular VR unit in the world. Most people's first experience with VR was on this, exactly how Google wanted it, and that might have been a mistake. See, some would argue, especially at the time, that Google Cardboard was really just a toy. While it was the most accessible VR unit, it wasn't a good representation of the technology. It was like trying to convince people that television is an amazing technology by showing them a still image of ALF on a 4-inch black and white TV. Only white noise spills out of the speaker. It's technically a representation of television, but you might be turned off the whole idea because of the experience. At the time, some would argue that the Gear VR was a far more proper per VR headset, something that would give a better first impression. After all, the tracking was smoother, the applications more in-depth. Cardboard was arguably doing more harm than good, and I agree, but I don't think either of these are a good first impression. In fact, I think you could make a solid argument that neither of these are proper VR at all. Cardboard and Gear VR were different than the early Oculus dev kits in more ways than just the lack of controls and the expanded processing power. They lacked a fundamental feature of what VR is supposed to be. It's the difference between 3 degrees of freedom and 6 degrees of freedom. 3 degrees of freedom tracks rotational movements. On a headset, this means when you look around, the image on display can track where you're looking. In 6 degrees of freedom, a headset will track not just rotational movement, but positional. This isn't just about room tracking or being able to walk around. In a 6 degrees headset, when your head moves forward or backwards, left to right, it affects what you see on screen. In 3 degrees, the image stays completely still because only the rotation of your head can be tracked. The result is that these phone VR headsets feel like looking into a moving picture rather than an actual 3D world. And if you've used a modern headset and you try to go back to these units, you'll probably get motion sickness very quickly. And that's an issue. Cardboard, even with its new influx of users, had a hard time generating too much public interest beyond that initial novelty. People would use it for minutes and never again. After all, there's only so much you can do with the headset that has one button and makes you sick. But it turns out Google wasn't stopping here. There was a reason they were still investing in this VR project, and it was to set up for the launch of something that would go beyond cardboard's limitations. Now, this is obvious, but a, a VR headset, it's something that you wear on your head. Yes, if cardboard was the beta, Daydream was the final product. They came out swinging with what promised to be a comprehensive overhaul to how Google managed both VR and its place within Android. This was the real deal, or at least it was probably going to last longer than Cardboard did. This time, things would be different. There would be strict minimum specifications that phone would have to meet to be daydream ready. With this, applications would no longer have to accommodate for those low-end aging devices. The headset was actually a headset made of cloth, built for comfort. It had a fancy controller, or at least fancier than a cardboard button. It was motion controlled, but not the kind of motion control you might expect from a newer device. Again, it was three degrees of freedom. Rotational position was tracked, but not positional. Daydream offered a more cohesive user interface, closer to what the Gear VR had. Regardless, it was better than cardboard's solution of just take your phone out whenever you want to switch apps. Daydream, from the moment it was announced, promised to be the new center of phone VR. Even Samsung, who had its own ecosystem to worry about, jumped on board. With Google's full backing behind this, there was a chance that this was the start of VR's mainstream success. But there was problems. There's always problems. Daydream, like the Gear VR, only supported select devices, and it wasn't a lot of devices. In fact, no existing phones would work with it, only upcoming flagship releases by a few partners. The devices would all have to share in more powerful processors, accurate sensors to detect motion, 
they would be on par with the Gear VR's offerings, but still, this was nowhere close to an Oculus, or an HTC Vive, or even a PSVR. Tracking was still limited to that 3 degrees of freedom. Sure, it would be better than cardboard, but this was no replacement for real VR. Daydream got quite a bit of attention when it was first revealed, but the good sentiments didn't last long. By the end of 2016, sales were quite low, because almost no phones supported it. Samsung Gear's VR, on the other hand, was selling well, and over the years was updated to support new phones, switch to USB-C, make it more comfortable, and increase that field of view. Daydream was cheaper, but only worked on a few brand new phones. Gear VR had more applications and established lineup of devices, and had been supported for a good few years up to this point. Samsung was smart to back both, because whoever won, it really didn't matter. As long as phone VR was the future, they would be a part of it. But then a big ol' wrench got thrown in the mix. Something was coming. Something different. The Santa Cruz Oculus prototype was a big deal. It was a self-contained device that used various cameras to track you without external sensors and with that six degrees of freedom. And those controllers, they'd have that functionality as well. Visually, it wouldn't match the power of a desktop PC, but it would offer many of the same features. This was all still just a prototype though, there was no planned release dates or pricing. But it was clear that whenever this kind of tech hit the market, it would be serious competition to both the Gear VR and Daydream. Much like before, there was no way to know for sure whether consumers would continue to adopt cheap VR headsets that used their existing phones, or if they'd want a slightly more expensive but real VR headset. So Google responded by trying both. In 2017, Google returned with a new Daydream model, solving a few of the issues that came before. Better cooling, less light leakage, and best of all, new colors. Still, only a few phones would support it, but that wasn't the star of the show. They would also announce standalone VR units that worked with the Daydream platform. Two, to be exact, one by HTC Vive and one from Lenovo. These standalone headsets would solve Daydream's biggest issue by adding that six degrees of freedom. They weren't releasing anytime soon, but it went a long way in showing that this underperforming platform wasn't going anywhere. Samsung was more content continuing to do the whole Gear VR thing. They couldn't really do a standalone headset because, well, Oculus was mostly making this thing, so they just added a motion controller. Around this time, many began to speculate that Samsung would leverage AR and the cameras of upcoming phones to move Gear VR closer to its PC counterparts. You can find quite a few interesting demos that used AR core to give basic positional tracking to newer Samsung devices. They were hacking in six degrees of freedom on a device that only supports three, but these were unofficial. It's all very cool and genuinely impressive, but it wouldn't matter unless Samsung officially included this functionality in the next headset. And they didn't, ever. By 2018, new phones would be announced, and the Gear VR wasn't being mentioned alongside them. No support for newer flagships, or even a new model. While sales numbers were seemingly great, the best-selling VR unit that wasn't made of cardboard, there was a bit more to the story. Many of these headsets were given away for free when you bought a new device, whether you wanted it or not. Those that did get one, and decided to actually set up the Gear VR, didn't stay for long. We never got official numbers, but it was clear that user engagement was not there. As you can imagine, if Gear VR was having a hard time, Daydream was just dying. Sure, Google would still support it with new Pixel phones, but it was beginning to be more clear that this was on life support. No major updates were being announced for the platform, and for good reason. Phone manufacturers just didn't care about getting new devices certified with Daydream. Even years after launch, only a few phones supported the device, and the ecosystem was not growing. HTC Vive decided to pull out, making their own standalone unit that didn't run off Daydream. Lenovo's headset, the Mirage Solo, would launch with all the promised features, but with little fanfare. Even with positional tracking, it was expensive at $400, far beyond the Gear VRs and Google Cardboards. This was well into proper VR price territory, and if somebody was willing to drop $400 on a VR headset, it was more than likely they already owned a powerful PC, an Oculus, or a Vive, or any other headset. 
and unlike those, this was stuck running mobile games. It also showed a major limitation of the Daydream platform. Almost every application developed up to that point was designed for use with three degrees of freedom, and only a select number of new titles would care to update support or be developed explicitly for a headset that nobody was buying. So even with the limited Daydream lineup of apps, only a mere fraction of these would see any benefit on the new headset. Around this point, Oculus had launched its own standalone units, the Oculus Go, and to the dismay of many, this was not that Santa Cruz prototype. In fact, it was just a Gear VR with the phone part built in. It seemed like this was the death of Samsung's grand experiment. I mean, this was running on the same Gear VR services, still with no six degrees of freedom. A very similar controller to what Samsung had, running the same applications that Gear VR already had. It would be a few months later before that Santa Cruz prototype actually released. It was in the form of the Quest. The Quest 1, not 2. Remember that. Now, it would be easier for the story if I could just say that the Quest killed phone VR. After all, it was six degrees of freedom, both for the controller and the headset. Enthusiasts could connect it to a PC, this was real VR. But it actually didn't sell that well. The biggest issue was price. It was $400, the same as the Lenovo, which was far too much to ask the general public to pay for a technology they were unsure about. Especially since, for the last few years, this was what most people saw VR as. While I'm at it, I should mention one of the last phone VR units. And it didn't work on phones. Yeah, Nintendo, deciding to be quite late to the party, jumped in all of this at a less than ideal time. The old Nintendo Labo VR kit. While this isn't really phone VR, it operates off the same basic principles. Three degrees of freedom. You hold up the device to your head and you get an approximation of VR. While the software had that expected Nintendo charm, it was still very subject to technical limitations. The cardboard in Gear VR looked pretty bad, but the Switch had an even lower resolution than the phones that were releasing at the time. And it's not the most powerful machine, so things are going to get a bit blurry. It was pricey as well, costing more than a daydream once you bought up all the expansion packs. One interesting part I do need to mention is this elephant kit, however. This cleverly used the IR sensor on the Joy-Cons to allow for six degrees of freedom, but only for the controller, and only for specific games. Reviews were moderate impressed with what Nintendo was able to come up with, but software support was limited. Nintendo's VR efforts only ever extended to a few titles, and trying to play Breath of the Wild in VR ended up being a nightmare. Sales were meh, and in many ways, Labo VR was the swan song of this whole trend. By 2019, it was clear that the Samsung Gear VR was dead, and Google had stopped announcing support for Daydream on its upcoming Pixel phones. The newest version of Android would not support Daydream at all. Google would go on to say that there hadn't been the broad consumer or developer adoption we had hoped, and we've seen decreasing usage over time of the Daydream View headset. We saw a lot of potential in smartphone VR, being able to use the smartphone you carry with you everywhere to power an immersive on-the-go experience. But over time, we noticed some clear limitations constraining smartphone VR from being a viable long-term solution. Most notably, asking people to put their phone in a headset and lose access to the apps they use throughout the day causes immense friction. Daydream would be wiped from history. You can't buy it from Google's website. In fact, you can't use it on an Android device that's been updated in the past few years. The Gear VR suffered a similar fate, and in 2020, Samsung had announced that it was closing all VR services. In an ironic twist of fate, mere weeks after Google had announced the death of Daydream, the Oculus Quest 2 would launch, going on to be the most successful VR headsets of all time not counting this piece of cardboard at least. It turns out the masses were fine with VR. It just couldn't be this half measured, cheap experience, but it also had to be cheap in the other way. I don't think any company seems too keen on returning to the phone VR fad. It was entirely of its time, a means to get this prohibitively expensive technology into people's hands without breaking the bank. Sure, over the course of half a decade, this might all seem like a failure, but a lot of developers and applications spawned from these weird little machines. Beyond that, 
I, I can't imagine this will have the most positive legacy. I don't want to sound too harsh, but in 10 years, will people even consider this VR? Like, is the Virtual Boy a device that was marketed as a VR unit with 3D visuals and zero degrees of freedom considered VR today? Probably not. Surprisingly, it wasn't until 2021 that Google stopped selling the cardboard, which means it actually outlived its own successor. Even today, it still works on modern devices and remains an open source platform for mobile VR. I don't know who's still using it, but it's there. I know I'm saying this with the benefit of hindsight, but a phone is designed to be a phone. Screens would have needed to see a dramatic increase in resolution just to keep up with these units, and adding in more sensors, cameras, and ways of tracking movement simply to accommodate the minority that shoved these things into headsets probably would have never worked. In a lot of ways, Google was on the right track here with this piece of cardboard. People did want mobile VR, but the compromises that needed to be made to get this to work in 2014, I think that caused more harm than good, at least in regards to the public perception of the technology. I can't say I'll his phone VR. I don't think many will. It was a product of its time, intentionally so. It was unrefined, simplistic, and made a lot of people sick. But even still, it was a neat glimpse into what the future could hold. It just turns out that future didn't involve shoving your thousand dollar phone into a piece of cardboard.